I'm Lorna Ross. I'm the Director of Design at the Centre for Innovation at Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. And I am um, I'm going to speak to you today about the role of design in healthcare and particularly what we're doing at the Mayo Clinic. There's an interesting kind of history, you know, from a design perspective and from a kind of creative perspective, there's a legacy in, in healthcare. There's been the kind of role of the creative for a long time with medical illustration, medical model making. There is a scientific glass blowing, which is actually we have a glass blowing department at Mayo. The Department of Engineering at Mayo, there's a kind of you know, really rich tradition of the kind of collaboration between the craftsperson and particularly surgeons in terms of crafting medical tools. And so it's a wonderful legacy to kind of come into as a designer. At Mayo right now, we're doing a type of design that's called service design, which is a little bit unusual in the healthcare setting and more typical, typically seen in retail, banking, hospitality, where products have shifted from being, or from where kind of markets have shifted from being based on pr selling products and more selling services. And so frequently people talk about experience economy, and the idea that the competitive advantage that you're going to get from your brand is thinking about how well are you curating the experience that your customer is having. And that started more in the kind of consumer market and is migrating into other industries and it's really impacting healthcare because, particularly in the States, the, the patient as a consumer is becoming much more vocal in terms of their expectations and the market is very competitive and the degree to which people have to compete for those customers and also the accountability we have in terms of like measuring not just patient outcomes but patient experience. We're actually held to a set of metrics, um, particularly in the hospital, it's called HCAPs and so we really have to report out on the degree to which we're consciously managing a patient experience and trying to curate that and trying to make it as compassionate and humane as possible. So there's the medicine and there's also the kind of experience of healthcare. So I'll talk a little bit about um, how we do that. First of all, I wanted to just really briefly touch on the aspects that make in Mayo you know, intriguing as a place to work, really compelling as an environment and as a culture, but it also particularly hard to innovate. And so there, I've just highlighted a couple of things here. We're 150 years old, we're almost as old as the matter, not quite, so getting there. So it's, it's you know, the idea, of, I come from an innovation background in terms of having worked in a lot of industries where innovation is something that is a competency that is, is kind of really part of a corporate environment. Bringing it into healthcare and into an organization this old, there's a, there's a, there's a kind of cultural resistance to change that's just kind of part of the fact that for so long there's traditions around how things are done. And Traditions really drive a lot of healthcare. A lot of the rituals and a lot of the, you know, even the kind of the norms that exist in a healthcare setting are based on kind of history and they're often quite romanticized. Um, we're really big. We have 65,000 employees. And so, again, from a perspective of innovation, the larger you are, the more the implications of you know, how you impact people's experience, you really have to think about the kind of general idea of when you start to propose shifts. In, in the model, you're really thinking about the degree to which that's going to have a, a, a ripple effect across the different employees. And so you have to be very conscious of people's anxiety around change when they've invested in something. We're a not-for-profit, so Mayo Clinic as a, an organization, <coughs> it's different than having, you know, I've worked in corporations where when you try to innovate, you create incentives. And so there's a standard way um, businesses innovate and they typically determine what the um, what um, characteristics or behaviors they want, to, they want to kind of trigger in their employees and what they want to reward. And they create these reward systems that then really migrate that model towards something. We don't have that same mechanism at Mayo where we can start to create this reward system that really promotes behavior. So we have to, our behaviors have to really come, come from a cultural perspective. They can't be coming from an incentive-based perspective. Uh, we have consensus decision making, so it's a, we have a very large voting staff and faculty and the degree to which decisions are made by committee all the time and it's very much part of the Mayo brand and it's very much part of how we maintain a focus on the patient. It also means that from an innovation perspective, if you need to have a large amount of people agree on something that is perceivably or potentially disruptive, you tend to have that 
that consensus really neutralize any radical idea. So any idea that's risky or experimental gets very neutralized in that process. We're physician-led, so the, again, the voting staff. And there's something interesting about working in innovation in an organization where physicians ultimately are the, um, it's like, you know, they're the ones who are making all the important decisions. And they have a really strong appetite for evidence and proof. And so they are most comfortable making decisions when there's a lot of evidence and a lot of proof. From a creative perspective, innovation is often a bit of a leap of faith. And so we really kind of have to find that balance between the degree to which we can, as a, as a design group, we can create enough um, collateral that is kind of proof of concept. And so we talk a lot about the idea of, as we run our experiments, we really have to be able to create evidence to then show to this community that, that gives them enough confidence to, um, to kind of, you know, attempt these things that we're asking them to do. So I think it's a really challenge, it's a challenging for innovation to do that. We're highly regulated, so part of being in the kind of healthcare market is that there's a lot of kind of regulations around patient safety and patient privacy and stuff. And so the degree to which we can be really spontaneous in terms of what things we do, it's very, very hard to be spontaneous. And it's very hard to do things that, is, are, that are experimental. And then we have an indirect value model in that, particularly in the States, and I believe also here, is that the patient is a customer, but he's not really the client. I mean, the client, he or she is not the client. The client is really the person who's paying for this. And so we have all of the insurers are very, uh, dominant in terms of, you know, the kind of, but in, in, in with when we think about the healthcare proposition and what patients perceive as value, it's really about also considering what the payers perceive as value. And so understanding the business models are in, and the kind of economics of healthcare are very important. So this slide is, um, when you think, when you kind of come into an integrated practice like Mayo Clinic and you start, uh, you know, f my experience trying to understand it and trying to really get a mental model of how it's organized, I found this really compelling. The idea that our growth and the kind of general growth in medicine in terms of medical expertise meant that there's a lot of fracturing of the practice. And so it went from being a small practice where it was you know, a lot of generalists where, people, where the, the physicians that practiced there were kind of, um, they had a broad range of expertise. And as medicine became more and more expert, people had to really carve off expertise. And so we, now we have this very, very fractured model. And if you look at, for example, internal medicine, which is here, and you look at the subspecialization and then again, sub subspecialization, What's important for us to note here is not, I mean, this is curious for lots of reasons, but from an innovation perspective, if you start to work in any of these departments, um, the degree to which you can then take your innovation that's worked in one department and migrate it to another department is really difficult because they, they identify as being very distinct. They don't identify as being part of one kind of system. And it's a big part of the kind of idea that medicine is both an art and a science, and there's a lot of kind of personalization and customization of the practice of medicine um, at the individual level. And so it's really hard to standardize things. And particularly when you're innovating, your goal is to innovate, do proof of concept, and scale that. And that's where you, it's very challenging. Uh, this slide is such a kind of interesting, um, I guess, indicator of when you look at a clinical setting like Mayo, you, the, the picture on the, the left is 1954, and it's a, it's a kind of consulting room in 1954, and then 60 years later, 2015, and really noticing how the, there not a lot has changed. And that's really significant to think about that in that space, in that span, when so much changed in medicine, if you think about the last 60 years and what, what has happened in terms of the kind of progression and the kind of the, the um, advancement of medicine, and you look at this space and say, nothing is changing in the context, the setting that we're delivering this product in. So these services are being delivered in a really standard way to patients and nothing is being innovated in that space. And this is probably the most important thing that the Center for Innovation looks at is this point where we not, not so much make the medical clinical product, but when we deliver it and how it's meaningful to patients and how patients can actually um, 
kind of embrace and understand and use those services. And that's the kind of, we talk about the last mile in healthcare, and that's that last mile where it's the hardest. And so this image really shows how little has changed. We've lost a window, we gained a computer, but other than that, these become these really ritualized spaces where people turn up every day and they role play and the environment is triggering those really enduring kind of, ro kind of um, role playing that's happening over and over again in healthcare and we think needs to be disrupted. So a kind of re a reflection that's kind of a standard reflection when you think about I any industry that scales to the degree that Mayo Clinic has scaled and again also the matter is that the classic response to increased scale in an operation is increased reliance on a process and so it's standardization and so from an innovation perspective you come into healthcare and you come into an organization like Mayo and you start to notice that we've really optimized towards standardizing and in healthcare the system is optimized now to mitigate risk and not create value and so you think about the efficiencies and the decisions that get made and the things that become standard practice and best practice um, which is what is, determines everything that happens in healthcare is a lot around mitigating and managing risk there's less consideration of the decisions that are made to actually create value. And so people perceive that indirectly value is created if you mitigate risk. And I think because the market is changing so much and customer expectations are changing, we need a more explicit way of um, both being able to evaluate or, or kind of communicate value and for patients to perceive value. And mitigating risk is just not enough anymore. This is a sta just a general kind of picture of a, a kind of process flow uh, diagram of what happens in one of our departments. And what's most interesting is that we have a very, very complex set of systems in terms of you know, how the organization works. And when we, when we as a group of innovators attempt to kind of um, critique and examine aspects of that, the degree to which we're looking for redundancy, there's a general kind of anxiety around taking things away. So people feel like we know that Mayo Clinic ultimately works. It's kind of like a black box, you know, patients come in and we work really, really hard and we use a lot of resources and expertise and we get great outcomes. But no one really has any kind of high resolution about where that value was really exchanged. We just know in general, it's an effective model. But the model itself, in terms of being able to kind of examine the points where we actually know that value is being exchanged, we can't do that. And that's significant when you're trying to innovate because then you don't know what you can break. And it's true for any large organization is that a huge part of having a competency about innovation is knowing when something becomes redundant or when new pathways are being kind of um, carved in the system. And if you don't have the capacity to kind of really see your system at a really granular level, then you're never going to know where your innovations are. And so this is, a real, this is characteristic of a problem we have at Mayo. It's just a very obscure system. Um, this is something I really like. This is an expression, again, it came out of, you know, some, the, we often talk about the Kodak moment. I mean, Kodak being an, an organization that, in hindsight, in 2020, people really looked at it as being an example of, it got so big and it could never fail, and then it's, you know, it's, it became obsolete really quickly. It became disrupted by its own kind of size and potentially by its own kind of arrogance. And so we talk about a Kodak moment. Um, the risk in that is, that, um, in other words, you get better and better at doing the wrong thing. And I back to this idea of standardization and back to this idea of mitigating risk is that sometimes when you scale, and you make investments and you make decisions about you know, kind of what your, where your emphasis is going to be, you don't realize if you're investing in something that ultimately is or fundamentally is becoming redundant because your market is shifting so much. And so this again, we play this, we kind of theorize or think about the degree to which Mayo is very good at what it does, but we, we speculate on what if we've get, we're getting really good at doing the wrong thing. And it's provocative, but it's really important to be able to ask yourself that question. This is a slide that um, it's, um, it's fascinating to see what's happening in the healthcare market right now in the States. And this was a um, PricewaterhouseCooper recently published a report, I think it's from last year, 2014, and it looked at, published a report and it said of the 50 top companies in the States, and so like really significant players in industry who have a remarkable kind of uh, leverage in terms of infrastructure, uh, just general wealth, I mean, just an organizations that are, you know, 
that have huge economic power, half of them, so of the 50, 24 of them have identified healthcare market as being a, as being a kind of growth area for them or an entry area. So they're now going into the healthcare market and none of them are medical. So they're retail organizations, technology, finance, telecommunications, consumer products. They're all identifying and saying the kind of general healthcare space, health and healthcare space is a viable market for them. And this is, this to us is remarkably disruptive because we've traditionally thought about our competitor, our other medical, academic medical institutions. And so to discover that, you know, a Walmart or a Target or a Google is actually our new competition is very hard to do because we don't really know how to kind of reframe the idea that competition is actually coming from adjacent industries. Competition will not be the same product but one with the same effect and this is a really important um, kind of shift for us is to understand that we, th we, we know that we make and sell Healthcare, health and healthcare products and medical in terms of services, procedures, care, care products. But how they're consumed is as an effect. And so we're looking at understanding that we, we don't have to now identify with peop other people who make healthcare products. We, have, we look at other companies that are actually offering the effect of being healthy. And so it's a really significant shift for us to think about less about what we call our product and more how our product is consumed as an effect. And that's a very abstract idea for the healthcare community to be able to think about, something we're really kind of trying to kind of navigate right now at Mayo. So if this is happening, our industry is happening, you know, I think a lot of kind of healthcare industries and markets the Center for Innovation, you know, when it was formed, there was a kind of an acknowledgement that it's probably not something that you can fix in a traditional way, in the same way as that a lot of organizations realize that if there's enough, if there's a kind of constellation of disruptors happening in your industry, it's unlikely you can just kind of weather that and stay the same. You're really going to have to adapt. And I think that capacity to adapt and to understand how to adapt to stay really relevant and to stay really um, feasible in that market is a, is a difficult thing to do if you've kind of traded on tradition for so long. And so at Mayo, we're trying to think less about fixing, you know, aspects of our model and thinking about a radical different practice model. Um, the way I like to phrase it is that I don't think this, it's moving from thinking that we're looking for answers to problems and focusing more on ideas. And that's a, maybe a subtle difference in terms of thinking a lot of innovation in a kind of vibrant environment would be more about you know, fixing things and just kind of the idea that the answers exist and it's more about identifying them. At this point in healthcare, we don't believe that there actually are existing answers to many of the problems. We think that we actually have to craft those answers together. And they come from often radical relationships, like really non-traditional relationships, you know, interesting collaborations, spending a lot more time understanding patients and kind of dialoguing with patients. And so it's, we're looking less for answers and more for ideas at Mayo. So let me talk about design. So in general, design is, um, when you think about it in the context of innovation, it's kind of human-centered innovation. So it's a really good way of coming at the kind of innovation um, process, but through, really, through thinking about the methodologies of, for, that designers use to kind of study the user to study unmet need to create and craft solutions to, and to kind of test those solutions. So, and so it's a really robust model to use for innovation. We don't design for how we are, but how we wish to be. And this is a sentiment that I think matters so much because particularly in healthcare um, and a lot of industries where they're faced with having to adapt and they're faced with having to kind of um, respond to disruptors, it can inherently be um, a kind of a, a time of anxiety and perhaps a time where people kind of people kind of become really resistant. And design is inherently aspirational. So this idea that we don't design for how we are, but how we wish to be, is an important and maybe um, it may seem insignificant, but the idea that you can actually use a process that inherently embraces the idea that actually things can be better, and that's may be underestimated about design, but it's, it, what it attempts to do is it attempts to craft and create solutions that actually make things better. And so if you're at a point where you have to pivot in your industry, 
you pivot towards a conservative response which is more about, you know, based on anxiety and fear, or you pivot towards something that's really aspirational. And using design helps you really embrace the idea that it is, it is fundamentally about aspiring to something. In general, what design is particularly good at, but particularly, I mean, I think really at Mayo right now, um, the idea of looking at the system from the perspective of the user, I mean, how people are navigating it, and really paying attention to the fact that people typically, even in complex systems, find you know, really kind of efficient pathways. And so frequently we, we think about, um, if I move to the next slide, this is, I think this is the system, if you think about healthcare system, it's very elaborate, it's kind of contrived, it's been um, organized around a set of uh, goals that are institutional goals, and so we, we set up a system that's based on how we want the process to flow. And it's optimized for a set of efficiencies and a set of goals that we have. And it becomes so complex and so obscure to the user that they find these pathways around it. And, we, then, we, and then we typically characterize their behavior as deviant. And so we talk, you know, a lot in healthcare you hear about either non-compliant patients or the deviant patient where they have decided to not use the system the way we want them to use it. And from a design perspective, they're actually the most important people to study because they're finding the pathways that are actually the most efficient. And it really is, it becomes this kind of like barometer, it becomes this indicator of where there are redundancies. And so if you follow the patients and you pay attention to what, you know, how they react to the system, you can learn so much about the system. So there's a, there's a real value in paying attention to patient behavior beyond the sentimentality of just wanting to know how they feel. I think they become like a really important asset for you to, to kind of, you know, that reflects your system and that you can use really actively. Um, we, when we spend a lot of time with patients, particularly in the clinical setting, we understand that the experience of treatment is, is frequently worse than the experience of a disease, and that's something that is, I think, never discussed, is that the, the, um, there's an assumption maybe that we've so normal, once you work in healthcare, you quickly normalize things that are, you know, profoundly disturbing and, and kind of distressing to people, but it's becomes, it becomes so normal that when you're in that context, in that environment, you forget how hard it is for people to kind, of nav to kind of encounter those conversations. And we have had patients say that the experience of actually, you know, when they are diagnosed and then they, have, then they make choices about treatment and recovery, the significance of those, of those um, actions is actually more distressing than having the disease itself. This was a, a quote from a patient who said, you saved my life, but you almost killed me doing it. And it's kind of interesting to have a patient, one, I think, to have the courage to be able to kind of play that back. It was someone that had had a really bad car accident, and this, this um, his reflection was years after this had happened. And I think he, had, he was able to kind of talk about the degree to which he understood that the medicine was so effective and the care was so effective in terms of making sure that he survived, but the experience of what had to happen to him and the degree to which they, this, the um, priorities were around obviously saving him and for being inside that experience, it felt like his, the priorities around his feelings and his, and his needs were something that was re were really um, absent. And this is the kind of thing that we need to understand more is that really understanding that from the patient perspective, we make assumptions about what they want and what they need, and also their capacity to tolerate and capacity to cope, and often it's really challenging for them. And so I, again, the voice of the patient becomes very important in understanding that. People have extreme and extraordinary preferences. Um, this is something that I had worked for uh, in the States. I worked for the Department of Defense, and we worked with a lot of soldier kind of communities that were very um, um, elite in terms of their needs and in terms of their in terms of the kind of activity they were quite an exclusive group and trying to design for them and trying to understand you know what their their um, goals were it was very very hard to fully understand how to design for them until one of them said to me one day you have to real you have to understand that we have extreme and extraordinary preferences and what he meant by that was the things that you assume about people, you generalize and make assumptions about what people's priorities are, are very different in this context and with this community. 
And it really helped me kind of like shift and like let go of a lot of the assumptions I had about design in general, but designing for users and even how to study them. I, I completely adapted the way I was studying that group. And when I came into healthcare and I started to kind of, you start to see patients and providers, but patients in particular in a healthcare setting, you realize they have a very unique and often atypical set of needs that are based on the fact that they're either, they or a loved one is either sick or potentially sick or recovering, but there's something about that, that um, experience that often really skews a set of needs or a set of goals. And so being careful to not make assumptions about what people need and want and how they advocate for themselves and their capacity to communicate effectively and not making assumptions that people can, are very skilled at being able to really make complex decisions and really good choices um, at a time when they're feeling incredibly um, compromised and challenged by what's happening to them. And I think that idea of both looking at them as a customer and looking at them as a consumer, but also knowing that they're going to be a very, very distinct set of needs and priorities. People fear the consequence of illness more than the illness themselves. And this is most true around the kind of chronic disease uh, area where when we've studied a lot of people when they have either early, you know, kind of ju they're just diagnosed and they're kind of, they're kind of processing the idea that they have a chronic disease. It becomes really loaded with a set of kind of guilt around the degree to which it was maybe based in some of the choices that they made, although we know more and more that's based on the kind of socioeconomic factors and even genetics. But the degree to which there's a lot of stigma in disease and there's a lot of stigma in terms of, you know, people being diseased and it can be very isolating. And so what happens here is that even though we feel a sense of achievement um, and even satisfaction when we identify a disease and name it, the naming of something for a patient is often very intimidating because then that often defines them socially. And so having a sensitivity to understanding what feels like success to us can be, you know, really like, like a kind of um, a very ominous proposition to a patient and we just don't realize that exchange is happening. Um, patients don't just want to know what Mayo knows, we wanna, they want to know how we know it. We study a lot of the kind of interaction between the provider and patient and we've tried to figure out what's really good communication, like really how to optimize that time to make sure that um, the patient is really engaged, is really understanding what's happening. We've, we've experimented a lot with the nature of good communication <clears throat> and I think it comes down to an interesting for a subtle difference between being really good at um, communicating effectively what Mayo knows and what we would like patients to do or what we're going to do and the difference that the patient looks for is less about what you know and how you know it and the process, so it means they want to understand our thinking process, they want to understand how we have made decisions, they want to understand how we have made connections and it's a very small thing to ask the provider to do but we've been, we've been like by really shifting the communication style at Mayo away from just um, having the confidence to offer an opinion is to more just to break down that opinion as a set of kind of um, a set of kind of insights that we have that together become an opinion and it has huge impact on patient satisfaction it has huge impact on patients capacity to fully understand what's happening to them and they perceive that there's a greater um, sensitivity to their need to understand and the trust is much higher when patients, when we, exp when we explain our thought process. And so again, a simple thing, you know, potentially not very innovative, but often it's just these pivots that we have to make to really create, you know, increase value for patients. Um, humans function by habit and not decision. I mean, more and more we're, look we're seeing as we study patients that um, we're kind of shifting a lot of the burden. I mean, there's, there's a kind of tendency in healthcare to attempt to migrate some of the burden of care to patients, and it's a lot due to the economics of healthcare. Um, but what we notice more is that in the healthcare setting, we want patients to be really engaged. We talk about the engaged patients or the activated patients, and we really want them to play a very active role at certain points in their care. But we, we've, we see that patients given um, autonomy and choice and control 
frequently take that opportunity and make the most conservative decisions and make decisions that are really biased by um, anecdotal data. They're, they find it very, very hard to rationalize things. They find it very hard to be objective in that setting. It's very hard to use statistical data, for example, for patients. So giving them that kind of data is kind of meaningless. It's not because they aren't capable of processing, but in these circumstances when they're ill or their family member is ill, it triggers a, a level of kind of um, survival. It's a bit like a coping mechanism. So because of the coping mechanism, people find it very hard to process data. And so we, when we study the outcome of decision making, it skews to being incredibly conservative, which doesn't reflect what patients ultimately want long term. But in this setting, they tend to bias towards the most conservative. And so it's something, again, we've, we've identified and we're really then thinking about the degree to which we demand decision making at points when patients just aren't ready. And so we're really trying to shift the decision making process further along in the, the care model. So this slide is, um, it's a pretty standard thing we do a lot. I and mean, these are called personas that are used um, in every design process and they're a way of really um, building out a kind of a composite of who your customer is or who your user is. Uh, they, they tend to be really useful in healthcare because people talk really generally about the patient and the, frequently we start to think about the patient as a data point or we talk about them as this, as if there's a general patient behavior and patient need. And when we work with departments, I mean, whichever department we would go in, maybe pediatrics or we go into oncology, um, and we are, the first thing we do is we spend a lot of time with patients and we build out a set of personas and what they do is they really start to kind of interrupt and challenge a lot of stereotypes and they become one of the most important things is to be able to talk about patients as a range of different people with a different set of needs and a different set of um, kind of capacities. I mean some patients have like a really high capacity for um, maybe deferring autonomy and being able to kind of trust. So they, they're very trusting. Some patients have a, have a very strong care network and so they have this huge asset that's supporting them. And so being able to kind of tease out the nuances of when you say patient, what do you mean? And, and these personas become very important both as we're doing our work to be sure that we're really understanding the spectrum of need in patients. And then as we start to come up with, with concepts, you go back and look at the persona and you, you, you basically make sure that your, your, this, your solution is addressing the needs of this range of patients rather than one patient. And they're very powerful. So another tool that we use a lot is um, patient journey mapping. And this is, it's similar to kind of um, process flow diagrams where organizations who understand their process flow in terms of, you know, it's often a manufacturing model. The way we do this is that we follow patients. This is an example of a patient going through, I guess, dialysis. And we, we do what's called patient tracers where we follow patients through a system. And we may spend weeks with one patient um, and they, we use them as the kind of thread as a way of exposing the system. So by being with them and allowing for all the different kind of variables that can emerge when a patient encounters the system and when their care kind of evolves and, and becomes kind of, um, is, is kind of emerging, we just follow that patient. And we start to see as a thread, we see the system exposed. And then we create a lot of artifacts like this. And what happens is it's a really, these things are very obscure. People don't typically have a lens on what the patient sees of the system. And by creating these um, graphs, it's a good way to both acknowledge how patients can kind of get really lost in the system, but it also then shows you where the value is being created. And so by doing this, you can look at the kind of the kind of point, the touch points that are really significant. And you can also look at the touch points that are not significant and often redundant. So this again becomes a great way of making a very obscure system really transparent. Um, we make the invisible visible. So this is a term that we've used um, carefully because it can sound pretentious, but there's uh, so, you know, the healthcare system is just this kind of it's again a very complex and obscure system even for the people working inside it, never mind for the patients. And so the degree to which anyone has a really comprehensive view of what's happening 
that it, it's, it's almost impossible to have that comprehensive view. And so people can tell you anecdotally different aspects of their experience of working in healthcare, um, but no one can give you the big picture. And so what's, what's, what's um, useful in terms of the technical skills that our, my design group have is that we're very good at visualizing things and it becomes a really important skill to be able to not only study the environment and study people and the user in the healthcare setting, but really quickly be able to kind of reflect back what that looks like. This is an example of some, a map that we did. We were asked to, to consider, to examine communication in the surgical suites. And so the, the chair for the Department of Surgery had a concern and anxiety about how inconsistent the kind of communication was across the different surgical teams. And a lot of it was being led by the tone of the surgeon determines what kind of communication happens in his um, surgical room. And so really having a sense of maybe we need to standardize and set some best practice around communication because these teams are really large. And so we went in and spent a lot of time looking at the environment. And again, we have some people on my team who have an architectural background. So quickly being able to kind of really study the environment and kind of represent it. And we were able to do that. And then in the next slide, you'll see how we use that floor plan, that template, to get the teams, the surgical teams, in terms of all the different functions, to um, annotate onto that th uh, their movements and the, t the equipment they use, and essentially trying to capture and visualize their, their burden, the kind of the, the work that they did, and their sphere of influence, and their cognitive load, and their physical load. And it was a simple exercise. We, at the time, were more curious just to kind of document how um, varied the movement of these teams were. And we thought this was just going to be for our, our own benefit to be able to analyze. What happened was the teams seeing this started to understand that there was a perception that the anesthesiologist, the surgeon, the pulmonologist, all the kind of perhaps the primary functions in the room were the ones where innovation should target. So if we were going to do anything different, we would focus on those three roles, and particularly the surgeon. We discovered that the circulating nurse was the one that had the greatest burden. And inherently, having the greatest burden, there's the greatest risk with that role. And so having visualized that and created this kind of what we call a type of evidence, the, t the chair of the department was able to really shift their thinking away from wanting to innovate around the surgeon and innovating more around the circulating nurse. So it was a really important moment for us to say, if in the absence of having created this map, it would have been um, an abstract concept and a controversial one to think about, you know, the kind of nursing needs versus the surgeon's needs. So we are thankful that we have these skills and we find the, um, the act of creating a lot of this collateral is very effective in terms of helping, helping drive really good decision making in healthcare. Um, people collaborate in spite of the tools they're using and not because of them. We see this over and over and over again. I mean, healthcare is a very much an environment where it's driven by the tools that people use. I mean, people use tools largely to communicate to capture information. I mean, we're, we're, a, we're an environment that is, de is, a lot of our protocols are triggered by tools, and yet the tools are frequently ones that have migrated from other industries into healthcare. So there's very few tools that are designed really exclusively to function in a healthcare setting. And we, particularly looking at in, in the hospital and the nurse, you know, this kind of nursing um, community, we t use this term hunting and gathering. And when they go looking for information, they talk about the hunter gatherer in terms of how hard it is to find information in this really frenetic environment when so much is competing for their attention. And their act of just using the electronic medical record is something that, and the only reason it works is because their capacity to, to create these workarounds and their tolerance for the ineffectiveness and their capacity to compensate. And so a lot of healthcare, what you see is really bad tools and humans compensating. And that again is an obviously an inefficiency we need to address because it's, it's not only risky, but it also leads to a lot of burnout. And so you think about all of the kind of um, dynamics of a healthcare setting when you're trying to protect your staff and you're trying to create efficiency Really bad tools are probably the single most single thing that is that actually really impacts people's capacity to function. Um, 
we know that in healthcare, what's most important when you're choosing tools is less about what the tool does and more about what you now don't have to do. And so everyone knows that you know, people who choose to work in healthcare want more and more time. They want to be with the patient and they want to be delivering care and that's when they're most satisfied. And more and more we've put tools in between them and the patient. And so understanding that as we develop more indigenous health tools, it's, le it's more about making sure that they create the capacity and the time for people to spend more time with patients and less time basically kind of preserving that tool. Um, I touched on this before, innovation that's additive is more tolerated, innovation that's subtractive or destructive is threatening. And this is, I think, a, as a general um, insight to innovation from all the places that I've worked is that as you as organizations kind of invest in innovation, they, they, they expect innovation to create things. They, they think it, about it as a kind of additive process where if you're innovative, you're making things. And in healthcare in particular, it's burdened with so much additive, so many things have been added to the system in terms of needing to satisfy over and over again different regulations or different needs, different standardized, and people find it very hard to know what to take away. And probably the, the most important thing to innovate in healthcare is to be able to subtract and to destroy, to be able to kind of have the confidence to know what's not adding value anymore and take it out of the system. Design's not about a finite and absolute solution, but more about a process by which people move from what's known to what's unknown with confidence. And I, the next slide, which I think is my final slide, I, it, in general, design is perceived as being that's very much about outcome. It's about creating, it's about um, the kind of a, a finite thing. And in healthcare, more and more what we're discovering at Mayo is that it's the, the process of design itself is a mechanism that helps people imagine moving from something that they know and they're invested in to something that is kind of intimidating and risky. And we think about it like training wheels when you think about it like a stabilizers on a bicycle where the healthcare industry is demanding more and more adaption and it's demanding it more rapidly. And the degree to which large organizations even know how to embrace change and the kind of cultural impact of that is very hard. And so design becomes less of a less of a solution and more about a process where communities themselves can start to kind of practice and experiment with ways of doing things differently and then evaluate the effectiveness of that. And so it becomes like a staging area where people can do things in a way that is more speculative and that in a, it, with confidence. And so my final slide is a term that I've been using um, a lot in healthcare, I think it comes back to this idea of protect endangered emotions. And it's a, it's a much bigger conversation. It's kind of uh, the idea that we are more and more driving healthcare towards a set of industry oriented efficiencies in terms of what we want the industry to do and what we want the, our services to do in terms of our outcomes and our metrics for success. And along the way, patients are on this journey with us. And it's getting harder and harder for patients to find a way to react. The system is just becoming so rapid and so um, intimidating that patients are often really muted in that conversation. And I think as much as you can um, pay attention to people's reaction to what's happening then and really preserve their capacity to react and to tell you how they feel and to have an emotional response, it's a place where you'll probably find the greatest efficiencies. That's it, thanks.